going to continue to look at back to the basic stuff. Um, I don't know, Terrell, are you uh, are you taping me? All right. Um, we're going to look at uh, attendance, church attendance. Does that sound like a plan? I want you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians. This is actually, believe it or not, y'all are lucky tonight because the church attendance segment is the shortest one out of all this whole study. Yeah, it's going to be on Facebook. So y'all, y'all are going to let it. might be 10, 15 minutes long. It depends. We are going to, yeah. <laughs> Not that short. Um, you know, when we think about church attendance, and, and I'm going to ask you some questions tonight so uh, we can kind of have, I want a little bit of interaction um, and maybe some questions from you, and I'll have some questions. Because when I started this whole segment about back to the basics, I said that especially in a, in a classroom setting, it's been kind of different because usually I'm in a classroom setting and I don't have you ask me questions because a lot of people don't feel comfortable uh, reading in public and some people don't feel comfortable when I ask them questions if they don't know the answer. But it's been kind of different preaching through this uh, because, of course, um, you know, I'm usually the only one that makes the statements when I'm preaching uh, if you don't say amen or praise the Lord or anything like that. So um, we're going to look at church attendance. Why do we come to church? To hear the Word of God? I mean, y'all, I mean, why should we want to be, yeah, that's, we're going we're gonna to look at that tonight. He said edify for y'all Facebook uh, watchers. Um, but, you know, some people, they go to the point to where, in, as little kids, and I'm just going to tell you right out front, I went to church because I was just simply trying to satisfy the preacher, which was my dad. Um, so my attendance was required. And, you know, it's just like uh, some people make the statement, well, I don't want to make my kids go to church. Well, you make them go to school. Uh, and you make them do a lot of things. You, you make them clean behind their ears. That's good for them. You make them clean their ears. You make them put on clean underwear. You make them do a lot of stuff sometimes that they don't want to do. And it's no different, I believe, when you're raising them up. And the Word of God says that you're raising them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, I know kids, I, you know, I can remember like it was yesterday, uh, when you're a preacher's kid, you go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revivals, youth, youth, youth rallies, youth revivals. I mean, you're there every time the doors are open. But you, we didn't have a choice. And it, it got to be, uh, you know, are we going to church again? You know, but when we look at church attendance, you're not coming for me. Um, you know, some people say, well, but Tony, he, you know, he's going to get mad at us if we don't go to church. That, that's between you and the Lord. And I've, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a pick-me-up. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, it's a pick-me-up when you have a full house, when you get up here and preach. Uh, and it is our human side as a pastor. And it's the same way with you if you're teaching a class. Like for one Sunday you have 20 in your class, and the next Sunday you have five. And you're going, what did I do? What did I say? Am I a sorry uh, teacher? And I say something wrong or... Or something, you know, your mind goes through all. That's our human side. Uh, but church attendance is one of those things that we have to understand that we're edifying, we're uplifting the Lord, we're worshiping God, we're learning. There's a lot of different things that we're doing uh, when it comes to church attendance. Our church is a scriptural New Testament church, is it not? Say amen. Facebook watchers, say amen. And you notice what God says to us in the Word of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, number one thing, unto Him. Who is Him? Jesus, unto God. Uh, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end. Amen. Now the word amen, you know what amen means. Surely, surely, I believe what you're preaching. I believe what you're saying. So when you hear somebody say amen in church, it's not just 
for them to be verbal. Uh, maybe sometimes some people say amen to keep themselves awake. I don't know. Uh, but when it, when it talks about the church, it says, again, unto God be glory in the church. You see the reasoning behind church. We are to glory and edify the Lord God. We are to come to church, and what, and what is the avenue that we are to do it in? Now, I'm not saying that you cannot glorify the Lord out here, but let me tell you something. This church, the people, this is a place that is set aside, a gathering of the local New Testament church to come together to worship, to edify, to sing praises, to all those things. The church is set up for that. And that's the reason why this scripture says again, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Now some people, and I believe the reasoning behind that throughout all ages is sometimes we get the idea that the New Testament and the Old Testament was set up just a little bit different. They worshiped just a little bit different. And if you do a study, they, they did, they come a whole lot closer and worshiping the way we're supposed to worship than what we do today, just to be honest with you. Now, when we come together, we are to worship God. And that's why the importance, you cannot worship, you cannot edify, you cannot fellowship, and that's the big word that I want you to get here, is we have something in common. What, is, what do we have in common? Jesus Christ, He is our Savior. The Spirit lives in us. We come together, we, we read the Word of God together, we fellowship with one another. You cannot do that by yourself at home watching TV. Regardless of what y'all think on Facebook, you, you know, and I understand COVID and all that stuff, but understand, you cannot worship and, and, and give homage to God and humble yourself before God in any other form or fashion the, the church was set up for that. Now, um, let's, let's look at some other scripture. Uh, your, our service to God, if it is to glorify Him, uh, it must be through a New Testament church. It's never meant to be saved and just to sit at home. Never. Never in scripture. If you look at all the Gospels, and if you and I kind of look at it like this, and many of you here tonight, well, the reason why I've been preaching along the lines, number one, the Lord has led me that to the to what I'm preaching on uh, on Sunday morning. We're looking at the life of Christ, but I believe when we're we look at salvation, we look at baptism, we look at the church. Uh, we have been looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Which what does that relate to us? That relates to us the life of Christ. That that relates to us what he done in his personal ministry, the doctrine that he taught. And when Jesus Christ ascended, when he, when he died, uh, when he was buried, when he rose again, he ascended up to, to heaven. Uh, he came and he empowered the church with the Holy Spirit. Y'all remember that? And when we go from the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we go directly into, this is the way I usually preach it, we go into the book of Acts. Because that tells us what the recipe of a church is. What is the first century church? What, what, how, how was this church successful? And I believe the recipe for that church in Acts should be the recipe for us. But you cannot worship like you should. You cannot do the things and edify and worship if you're not here. You can't do it. So, we're looking at this tonight, looking at uh, the New Testament church, we are to glorify Him, and it must be through a New Testament church. And I know someone out there is probably saying again, oh, but Tony, you just don't know. Me and God got this thing going on, and I can just go anywhere I, I, can, I can, and I can just worship just as good at home as I can in church. Let me tell you something. That's a lie from the devil, and I promise you this. Most of the time when somebody says that, they're not doing anything for God. Say, Brother Tom, I can't believe you said that. Yes. I'm going to tell you, everyone that I have ever come into contact with that has made that statement in the last 24 years, you look at their life, 
they have no fruit whatsoever. Let me tell you something. We are to glorify God and to worship God and to come together. Here's what it's all about. Teresa, I'm going to come, and I'm, I'm coming to church, and Kim and Terrell and, and uh, Gary, we're going, to come, we're going to come to church, and we're going to open the Word of God. We're going to read the Word of God, let the Holy Spirit speak to us through the Word of God, and then we're going to fellowship with what we just read. That's what fellowship in a Baptist church is more than an eating meeting. It's coming together. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's the best, the best of both worlds when you get to eat physical food and spiritual food, too. It's the best of both worlds. Now, what well, it says in Scripture, they, they broke bread. They, they went from house to house, fellowshipping. They took the Lord's Supper in the, in the context of the New Testament church. Now, it goes on, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. <coughs> you cannot truly glorify God if you are a member and you're not there. Okay? Most of the people that really need to hear this won't look at it on Facebook and they're not here. Okay? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and verse 25. We are, not, we are told not to forsake church attendance, as some do. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So you see uh, the assembling, what is so important about coming together as a local New Testament church, it says not to forsake the assembly. What is that talking about, forsaking? That's pretty elementary. You're just not going. I mean I, I mean, I can take you across the country today. We can look at the attendance rosters, the attendance membership role of the majority of Baptist churches that I've pastored, and they'll have 650 members. And a hundred show up. Some of them you couldn't even find with a Geiger counter. Amen. They said, Tony, you're trying to be fun. No, I'm just telling you. They are forsaking the assembly of this church, if they are a member of this church. How many of you know someone? Y'all know a lot more people than I do. It's a member of this church and don't come. Now, how many of you you know, I, I, I understand. I want you to see this about church attendance. Don't leave here tonight and say, well, Tony said, me t and we're going to get into this in depth. How many of you get vacation time? How many of you are retired? Now, my dad said, I'd never retire. I'm retarded, but I'm not I'm ret I'm retired. But understand, I understand as a pastor that when you've worked hard all your life, Amen? Don't quit on God, but there are things that you want to do that you never was able to do in life. Amen? One of these days, Brother Tony's going to retire. And guess what? I'm going to get my camper and my truck, and I'm going to go and see America. And I'm going to preach at every place I can get to. Now, understand, don't leave here and say, Brother Tony said you're not ever supposed to take a vacation, you know, and all this stuff. I remember one church I went to, they asked me, uh, I asked them, I said, how many weeks vacation do I get? Because I never take what I'm supposed to get. And back in 2006, when I pastored at Bethany, they gave me five weeks vacation. And I'm like, man, I'll never use that. Well, I never took them, so they made me take them. I, I didn't know how to take that, really. You know? <laughs> so... Anyway, so that's what I'm saying. When I say not forsaking the, the assembly of yourself and church attendance, understand when, when it comes to church and attending church, we are to attend church when we can. Amen? You're going to be sick. Do not come when you're sick. Okay? Now there's going to be times that there's going to be family trouble. There's going to be family things that come up. Don't come. Because if your mind and your brain is somewhere else, 
guess what? You're not, are you really going to worship? Now, so we go into church attendance. What does church attendance do? It builds us up. In Jude 20, uh, our, it builds up ourselves and our brothers and sisters in Christ. It says, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What else does church attendance do? Is it just, oh, Brother Tony, again, and many of you think, well, I'm going to come because Brother Tony's going to be disappointed. Let me tell you something. Yes, my human side, if nobody comes, I get a little depressed. Amen. But over 24 years of preaching, I preach to the ones that show up. I cannot, you know, and again, here's my biggest pet peeve. Learn this tonight. I don't like being the last to know anything. All right? Prayer requests, different things like that. Things that are going on in the church, things that are going on in families. Don't let Brother Tony be the last to know. That's happened in the last few weeks. I'm just going to tell you, Facebook. Don't let Brother Tony be the last to know. Because Brother Tony, uh, uh, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, so it builds us up. Number two, it equips us for the battles ahead. Look at Ephesians 6.11. Now, you know, y'all know about Ephesians 6. It's talking about putting on the whole armor, going into the Christian walk. You're going through life. How many of you, when you wake up in the morning, you heard me preach this before? Jenna, when you get up in the morning, what side of the bed do you get up on? The right side? I was hoping you'd say that. Now, every morning when you get up, now Jenna, how old are you, Jenna? Fourteen. You say, well, what has she got to worry about? How old are you, Jamie? Fourteen? You fourteen? Thirteen? Y'all thinking, what have they got to worry about? I promise you, a bunch. Being a teenager, you've got some battles ahead of you. You've only just begun. When you look at Ephesians 6, I want you to see this, and that when you get up in the morning, you're going to face a battle every day. You're going to face physical battles, but more importantly, you're going to face spiritual battles. Did you know that church and attending church and assembling together and fellowshipping together helps you in your life because you see everybody around you fighting spiritual battles? They're going to go, you're going to go through spiritual battles and you're going to look at somebody over here that's been through some spiritual battles. You know, that's the reason why I love to talk and preach and kid with these teenagers is because I know I'm old now, fixing to be 50 years old, but understand, I've been through some of the spiritual battles plus some that you're going to face. And you know what? You can come to Brother Tony and you say, Brother Tony, this is what I'm facing. Oh, but I just don't feel comfortable coming. Let me tell you something. I am your pastor. You come to me. I've had so many teenagers. I know it takes a while to get warmed up to me, but I don't know why it would take you that long. But you're going to face those battles, and guess what? Through the Word of God and through my experience and through other people's experience that you're fellowshipping with, you can learn how to go through those battles. You see, how, you see how it works? Look at Ephesians. If, you want, if you're going through a battle, Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole armor of God. Now, before that, it tells us all the pieces of armor. You know, you, they, you had to have all the pieces of armor. It's the same thing, and I give this example. When I go out on the football field, you know, I go out there with my, my helmet and my shoulder pads. I put my helmet on. Now, if I went out there with just my shoulder pads on and my thigh pads and my butt pads and uh, my knee pads and I didn't have a helmet, guess what? I'd be in trouble. I'd say, Brother Tony, you wouldn't be in trouble. You're hard-headed. Now, if I went out there with my helmet on without my shoulder pads, guess what? I'd be in trouble. Let me tell you something. If I went out there with just one tail pad gone, that hurts if you ever fell on your tailbone. You have to have all that equipment to be able to fight against the wiles of the devil 
and your armor. In the, but let me tell you something. You not only need that, you need the church. You need that fellowship. And so it says again, it says, equips us for the battles ahead. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So there's a reasoning why you, ha you need that armor. You're going to get up, Jenna, 14 years old, right side of the bed, and you're going to have a spiritual battle every day of your life that you wake up. You're going to have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So, but Tony, why is that so important? Because those are the three things that the, that the devil put on Adam and Eve from the very beginning, and it's the same three things that we face today. You're going to face that. Gracie, you're going to face that. Thomas, you're going to face that every day when you get up. Say, but Tony, which one wins? Which one you feed the most? If you start off with the Word of God and you start off with prayer, you know what? Boy, you're already, you're already on top of it. Okay? So, so it builds us up and equips us for the battles ahead. It also acts, I believe, as a, as a cleansing agent. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So, I believe when we come to church and we attend church, guess what? We see our fellow uh, Christians going through those things. And I believe that when we bounce those problems or, or bounce those experiences off of other people, I believe that helps us clean up our life. Now, you've heard me preach this before. Somebody that's went through a, a trial or a tragedy in their life, and they're a member of our church. Then you have someone over here that goes through the same thing. Maybe Brother Tony hasn't been through that trial or that tribulation or that heartache. Guess what? The best one that you can talk to is this person that's went through it. How did they go through it? Well, I've learned that a, a lot in my ministry. You try to counsel someone, yeah, I can tell them what the Word of God says, but if I haven't been through that trial or that tribulation, I'm not going to come up to you and say, and I used to do this until I caught myself lying. Because I said, I know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Go to someone. That, and again, if you're not coming, and you're not fellowshipping, and you're not around the people that have been through that, that's what hurts us. That's what hurts us as a child of God. So, so it builds us up, it equips us, it acts as a cleansing agent, and it aids us in maturing in Christ and all its effects. In Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12, it says, And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. <coughs> so, he, he gives us certain jobs in the church. We have teachers, we have preachers, we have all those people that work let me tell you something. We do everything that we do. Brother Caleb leads the music. Sister Rita cleans the church. Sister Celeste does the bulletin. Sister Teresa and, and Pam decorate. Sister Kim is the organizer. And I can go right down to the tech guy over here. You know, I can go right down the line. And let me tell you something. Every job, everyone has a job in the church. Amen? You can either pray. You pray for your pastor. Pray for your church. Say, but Tony, I physically don't do anything in the church. Let me tell you something. You are just as important. Everybody is important. Now, you might, well, I mean, you might be that person that brings Brother Tony a donut on Sunday morning. Just don't tell my wife. Okay. But it aids us and it, it matures us. And it also, it, stand, it stands out when you come to church, it stands out as a testimony as to who we are and to whom we serve. Do you know that? When you come to church, you got a neighbor. How many of you got neighbors? Did you know when you come on Sunday morning, you've heard me say this before, when you come on Sunday morning, they're watching you. 
They know when your car leaves and they're going in their mind, uh, he's going to church. That family is going to church. And when your car is sitting there on Sunday, guess what? They know that you, you didn't go to church. Okay? Is our Lord and, and Savior, is He worthy? Is He worthy for us to come and to worship Him? I believe He is. He is worthy for everything that we do. Now, also it means I love what Christ loves. His church, His people, His word, and His work. So how often should I attend? The answer Every time the doors are open, unless physically unable or providentially hindered. Hebrews 10.25 again says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. You remember our text at the beginning of all this in John 12.26. Turn over there. John 12.26. This is my last verse. <clears throat> Almost done. Told you it was short. Man, I've still been preaching for 30 minutes. John 12, 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. You know, as I've, I've been able to watch since we got internet to the parsonage. I've done away with my direct TV. Praise the Lord. So I've been able to get on and watch The Chosen some. You know, and it just amazes me how those disciples, sometimes we put them up in a, on a pedestal. They're just normal people like us. They're just average Joes. Now, I, can, I think they hit the nail on the head when they got that guy to be able to act just like Peter. I believe Peter was just like that. Amen. I think Matthew, I, I, I kind of question that a little bit, but anyway. But that goes to show you, you know, I believe when you have a guy like Matthew, uh, I think it goes to show the world that Christ can use anybody and everybody. But well, my point is this, those guys, when they were called out, he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You know, Nicodemus chose not to do that. What are we choosing to do? You know, it's so easy to follow Christ when everybody around us is following Christ. But when everybody is going the opposite direction, even in church, I pastor churches, folks, that not everybody was following Christ. What is your direction? What direction are you going in? Are we following Christ? Are we attending the Lord's church that He died for? If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am is where I want to be. All right? Where Jesus is is where I want to be. Church members, Jesus is in church every time that you assemble. Did y'all know that? So, on a scale from 1 to 10, how do you think, now, I know that you can't answer for everybody else. Ten being the best and one being the lowest. As a church, how do you think that our church ranks in attending and not forsaking the assembly? A two? A three? Facebook? Church members? Three and a two. Anybody else? Where do you think we rank? All right. Everybody stand.